In part one of the series, we examined some myths and misconceptions regarding aspects of the Zulu Army's tactics, deployments, and movements in the preliminary stages of the battle. In this part two of our chat with Colonel Mike Snook, we'll discuss the initial British deployments, the composition of the firing line, causes of the British withdrawal, the end game and the flight of the fugitives, and everyone's favorite scapegoat, ammunition supply during the battle. For those who haven't watched part one yet, may I recommend it to provide some context as well as biographical information on our most honored guest. There's not much else to say, really, that the good Colonel can't say better. So without further ado, part two of Myths and Misconceptions of Islam Dwana. As you may be aware, the complete recording of this conversation happened some time ago. In the subsequent editing, it was discovered that the audio, which was not optimum to start with, suffered greatly as the conversation flowed into part two. It was simply not salvageable. To this end, Colonel Snook, in a supreme offering of patience and professionalism, suggested re-recording the offending segments, and thus, here we stand, the recipients of his wisdom, with what is now unfettered clarity. Please join me in thanking him for his commitment. Uh, so we spent the sort of part one talking about the the Zulu side of things, their deployments, their their modus operandi, as it were, and the way they sort of executed their battle plan and, and the preliminary maneuvers. Um, we can perhaps jump forward here to sort of the initial British reactions. And on the surface, some of these preliminary British deployments seem to be a, a little bit disjointed um, and being separate from the actual camp area. Um, various elements are deployed, perhaps to the Talhani Spur, as we've uh, shown in the, the series thus far, and, and elsewhere. And it seems that given the, the, the general military concept of one doesn't want to split their forces, and obviously with Chelmsford being at the beginning with the bulk of the column, it, this has already sort of happened in the macro. We are sort of see this almost happening in the micro uh, under Polain, or generally uh, the, the camp, with elements being sent forward from the camp to various locations to either find or fight the Zulus. And it just seems to be this repetition of this concept that's you're not supposed to do. And I was wondering if you had any input as to the tactical considerations that may have driven these actions. Uh, yes, well, we what we need to do, I think, is to um, interject at this point, uh, the arrival of Colonel Durnford, um, who is uh, going to put the cat amongst the pigeons, as it were, for various reasons that we'll, we'll come to. But formally, up to this point, the camp has been under the command of Colonel Pullane, obviously, or Lieutenant Colonel Pullane, who is, holds his rank by brevet. Um, uh, and a brevet Lieutenant Colonel, which is a, an army rank, not a regimental rank, is always junior to a substantive lieutenant colonel. And Durnford is a substantive lieutenant colonel. He's also uh, actually a full colonel, uh, has been published as a full colonel in London, gazetted in London, but he doesn't yet know that he's a full colonel. Um, so it, it sort of has no bearing um, on, on the battle itself. But he is a lieutenant colonel. He is clearly senior to Pullane. And when he arrives in the camp, um, command of the camp must necessarily pass to him. And I think that um, because, you, I mean, uh, you know, it's really important uh, in, in understanding the sort of Victorian army, it's not exactly, it's not hugely dissimilar to modern armies, but it's, it is somewhat dissimilar. And, and this whole business of seniority is, is one of them. So that um, seniority was, was, did not imply, in, in other words, a body of troops must be commanded by the senior man. So um, just because you were the bloke um, uh, with the same cap badge as all the troops doesn't mean to say that they're necessarily yours. If somebody who is senior to you in the Victorian army turns up, you know, the command must pass to the, the senior man. So we, we've got a bit of a problem here with the two lieutenant colonels. One has been left behind uh, by um, Lord Chelmsford. 
under a very uh, distinct instruction uh, act strictly on the defensive to, to, to sort of condense what he's been told by Major Clary, act strictly on the defensive. And then Colonel Durnford, who's been ordered up from uh, Rourke's Drift, is actually a bit of a chaser around to find him because he's gone riding back towards help the car when his orders arrive with um, Smith Dorian at Rourke's Drift. Uh, and, and somebody has to be sent after Durford. He's gone to buy wagons up in, in the in the Biggersburg, which is in the direction of Elkmacar. So uh, he has to sort of be brought back. The column, his column's all ready to move, and then eventually they all move up to Nisandwana, um, a column consisting principally of the Natal native mounted contingent, uh, plus uh, three companies of infantry, uh, Natal native contingent infantry, uh, but merge into two, and then Major Russell and his rocket battery. So it's, it's not a big column, uh, and, and its most effective asset is the, the mounted Africans, the five troops uh, of, of um, the Natal native mounted contingent. Uh, and it, uh, in that sense, it's, it's perhaps rather more mobile than uh, Pelayne's command. So he's bringing mobility to the, uh, the task org, and that's probably something that, that Chelmsford has in mind. But I think there's also this idea that actually Chelmsford just wants to keep an eye on Durnford because of the various um, controversies that he's been involved in up to that point, where he reacts to Bishop Schroeder's intelligence of, a, of a, an apparent river crossing further down on the Tugela. He sort of crosses into Zululand. That, sort of throws a spanner in the works with Chelmsford, who gets very angry about it and sends him a sort of a fierce reprimand. So um, Chelmsford is, is wanting to keep a, a bit of a, a, a lid on Durnford, but also wants his assets brought up um, to reinforce the camp, Edison Luana, in his absence. Uh, and and will then, um, at some point, but not yet, I think, crucially, merge uh, Durnford into his in, into the sort of uh, number three column. So that num I mean, Durnford's command is known as number two column. So number two and number three effectively become one, again, under his lordship's uh, overall command. So, but Chelmsford has said and done nothing to indicate that he, Durnford should do anything other than, you know, uh, get to Sanwana uh, and take his boots off, basically, until he hears further from uh, Chelmsford. But Durnford is, is very much worked up with the, uh, the idea that he should be further forward, should be is required forward by Lord Chelmsford. And when he gets to, gets to the camp, I think he's surprised not to find any further instructions for him. But he, he does sort of settle down there for a, for a period of time. Um, without doing anything too dramatic. Uh, and so he accepts this line from Pelayne and his officers that we are acting strictly on the defensive. You know, by the way, we're stood too. You will observe that we're stood too. Um, because there have been a number of sightings and, uh, uh, this morning. And we, we've talked about those. So, uh, you know, we won't go back over that. Uh, but we know that at nine four, nine, between 9.30 and 9.45, there's this false start uh, for the Zulu army, uh, uh, which they've been sort of rolling back. Um, but there is, uh, uh, there's been a sighting up on the Talane Spur, and there's still some movement going on uh, in the distance. But the suggestion from Durnford to Pelayne is, well, if there's nothing much happening down here in the plain, which there isn't, uh, shall we get the troops to sort of stand down and perhaps have some breakfast uh, 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 and that's all sort of nicely science field delivered there isn't anything going on so the troops can stand down the proviso is that they uh, keep their equipment on and go and eat their own disturbed breakfast because they would have been at breakfast when the when the first stand two took place at, at 7 30. so there's a sort of a, a a rolling back of tension as it were at some point somebody decides that Talani Spur needs to be covered. Now, Durnford was not in the camp when that regiment of the Right Horn appeared on the Talani Spur, uh, but obviously would have been briefed upon it. 
And I, th I think there's some debate about which of the two lieutenant colonels sends Cave's company, um, E Company of the 1st 24th up to the spur. My inclination is to believe that it's more likely to be Pullane than Durnford, um, because he's the man who's more interested in the in the close defense of the camp, uh, whereas Durnford is, you know, sort of not that interested. And he doesn't want to tread on Pullane's toes anyway, because he doesn't believe that he's he's going to be staying there for too long. Maybe that that day, that night, perhaps, and then we'll go forward to Mangani and join Chelmsford. So there's a little bit of sort of um, tiptoeing, tiptoeing around the whole issue of command. But I think that Cave's um, dispatch out to the spur is probably at Pallain's behest, and he's conscious that there has been movement out there and that there's a bit of a gap behind McQuainy Hill down to the spur uh, where there's been enemy movement and he's got nothing up there covering that area particularly. So it makes sense to put um, uh, a body of troops up there. And he decides to send an imperial company um, so that it's got, what is he doing by that? Well, he's sending firepower out there on, onto that spur so that he can cover out in that direction. Uh, obviously, it's, it's got to be able to see in order to, to be able to shoot, uh, 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 and that's his interest. So he's deployed a company forward to a, to a vantage point where it can cover the dead ground to the north of the camp. Now, as I say, for a period thereafter, everything's fairly quiet, but then you get various reports of Zulu columns moving around on, on, on the high ground. And eventually, uh, or, and Durnford sends a number of people to investigate what exactly is going on. It's, it's a little bit confusing as to what these columns are up to. Um, and nobody seems to be able to convey exactly what's going on and so they send uh, a guy uh, called Higginson up there eventually he comes back and, and he's bearing a report from Barry's company that the Zulus are retiring everywhere so there's this whole sort of idea that of, of Zulus sort of lurking in the in the distant parts of the of the battle space not they yet know that it's a battle space um, sort of starts to recede. Um, and so I think this is a sort of a trigger for Durnford in that he's quite happy being in the camp whilst he thinks that the Zulus are maneuvering around the camp. But if they are retiring everywhere, then that doesn't fit with his game plan here. You know, he's quite keen to um, redeem himself with Lord Chelsea, having had a, you know, a very serious uh, telling off over the, his crossing into um, Zululand in response to Bishop Schroeder's intelligence. So he, want, he wants to get his name back. Um, and he isn't going to do that by sitting where there's nothing happening. So when he's told that the Zulus are retiring everywhere, he feels an inclination to follow them up in some way, to find out, you know, he wants to know exactly where they are, what they're up to, and so on. So this is all good, admirable stuff in terms of ascertaining the situation. Nothing wrong with that. But then, to go back, to, to pick up your question, it, it's what is he going to take with him to do that? Well, first of all, he's going himself, which as the sort of senior officer, you know, senior officer in, in command doesn't go and do recce patrols. So, you know, there's a bit of a problem there in terms of, of, of his response. And then, you know, he's going to send out Roar and Roberts with numbers one and two troops of the NN, NNC up onto the lower plateau to, to scour around from McQuainy Hill out towards um, the Ingrubaini Valley, which, as we know, is where the Zulu army is concealed. And then he's going to go out across the plain himself with uh, another two troops of his own NN, NNMC. That's a difficult thing to say, isn't it? Um, uh, and uh, he's going to take with him the rocket battery. There's going to be a, a company of his own NNNC infantry, about 150 men. And then he asked 
can I please have two companies of the 24th Regiment to come with me? So now he's really, really crossing a line here for, for Pelaine, who is really, you know, he's, he, you know, Pelaine's not in the business of um, getting into a row with, with um, Durnford, who is his senior officer. But at the same time, he knows uh, what makes tactical sense, and he knows what his orders are from Chelmsford. Act strictly on the defensive. If he sends two out of six companies out into the hills, he is not acting strictly on the on the defensive. He will have disobeyed the army commander's um, direct instructions on this point. So he can't really do it. But he's still uh, he doesn't sort of lay into Durnford in any way. But Melville, the adjutant who interestingly is 36 years of age, by the way, he's um, only three years younger than Pauline. And I think in terms of the mythologizing, we sort of tend to have this image of uh, Melville as a young man, and, and he isn't, he's a very senior Lieutenant, as I say, only three years younger than, than Pauline. So he's, he's quite a, an authority figure in his own right. Um, uh, has a very good uh, record, is, is well regarded, and he is the one that says to uh, Durnford, no, I really think that Colonel Pallade would be doing wrong to send companies out of the camp. So you then get this sort of backing away from, from that idea. And is the dispatch of uh, Cave's company linked into this? I, I don't think it is. I think that Cave's company being out on the spur is quite a separate issue. It is, they are two issues. We need to cover that bit of ground over there. And I think probably it's Pelaine that does that. And can I have two companies? No, you can't. So it's, it's two issues. Um, so Durnford, uh, gets into this scenario where he's effectively mounting his own offensive operation. It, you know, the combat power is, is too significant for it to be called a reconnaissance. It's not a reconnaissance. It's a sort of, um, I don't know really what you would call it. Um, because what we know with the advantage of hindsight is that it's gonna bump into 25,000 Zulus, which um, he is, he is not uh, equipped to do, you know, that's, that's a bad position to find yourself in. Um, but of course he doesn't know that. He thinks he's maybe, maybe he'll bump into 2000 Zulus, or I, I mean, I presume he's thinking along those lines, um, but that's not what's gonna happen. And it's difficult, but it's difficult to know in a doctrinal sense, just what is he about? It's a sort of, is it, you know, they have this reconnaissance in force expression, well, that's sort of, uh, that's, that's very American. Uh, that's not a sort of a, a British army thing. Um, and certainly not a Victorian army thing. Um, so this sort of strange grouping of people and you end up with the, about a hundred mounted uh, Africans up on the lower plateau, another hundred riding behind Durnford into the plain with 150 Africans on foot falling further and further behind Major Russell and his mule battery, mule born battery of uh, three uh, Hales rocket troughs. It's only about eight or nine men. Um, so that is, that really accounts for the fragmentation of, 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 of the British um, force at this point. There's a number of things going on. There's a defensive deployment to Thailand Spur. There's an offensive movement to the left front and into the plane dead ahead at 12 o'clock, as it were. I think probably that addresses the, the whys of the, you know, why, why did we get it? Why do we get these various moving parts at this, what is going to be a singularly inopportune point in the, in the timeline? Uh, uh, the point that you made at the very end here was that this mixture of offensive and defensive deployments I think is the best way to sort of summarize what's going on here is that, you know, two conflicting on the surface anyway, um, sort of ways of looking at the situation and different tasks or different implied tasks. Um, and I think that really sums up 
that that sort of it, it, on the surface it does for someone just looking at it it does appear somewhat confusing it's like mm. it's just a continued fragmentation as you say and um <clears throat> putting it in the right context as you've done i think lends a lot of clarity to that i i think it's important to say that um plane's command uh, is intact so in some small sense the spirit of Chelmsford's instructions, actually kill and defensive, have been adhered to. Um, and what I, it, it's very awkward on the sort of plain Durnford thing, is people tend to treat it, if you'll excuse my French, uh, as a pissing match, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a plain man, I'm a Durnford man. And that's obviously not the way history works. And I've been accused of, of favoring uh, Pauline in my interpretation of the battle because he's from my regiment or I'm, I'm from his regiment or, or whatever, successor regiment. But, um, you know, that, that doesn't come into the thinking. The fact of the matter is that one of the lieutenant colonels has been ordered to act strictly on defensive and does. And one of them has been ordered to come up to camp, does that much of his orders, but then does something else as well, which is uh, advanced to contact. Um, against an army of 25,000 men, which isn't really part of, of anybody's plan, including his own. Um, so, you know, and so it's, about, it's about military decision-making, you know, uh, and actually Durnford has overstepped the mark in terms of ascertaining the situation. He's doing more than that. He's going out, he's sallying forth like a, like a knight of old to, to do battle with the enemy. When actually that's not what's called for. That's not what has been ordered. That's not what's uh, called for. And of course, he is operating under this cloud of this furious bollocking that he's had from uh, Lord Chelmsford uh, in the recent past, saying, you know, watch your step. I mean, very directly, watch your step, or I will relieve you of your command. Now, that's pretty heavy stuff. So he's, he's keen to get it right, but dot, 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 he isn't getting it right. You know, he's charging off towards the last reported location of the enemy, not really knowing how many of them there are uh, or what to expect when he gets there. <laughs> it's not going to be a pleasant experience. <laughs> So we've talked a little bit about the initial British deployments and that fragmentation uh, that, that occurs uh, for right or for wrong. Uh, if we jump ahead now, um, the, 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 the contact obviously develops as the story of the battle goes. And um, there are some misconceptions about the phase of the battle where we find the sort of the main defensive battle joined the, the the firing line on the rocky ridge yeah, for lack yeah. of a better sort of way to describe things um yeah. after the firing line was established and consolidated on the rocky ridge um was there any involvement uh in that firing line of the nnc or indeed the nnmc uh and if if not then where does this idea which is one of those sort of popular conceptions out there, where does it come from that uh, that popular conception would have large chunks of the firing line taken up by NNC uh, men and, and, and subunits? Um, this, on closer examination, uh, perhaps this is not the case. I'm just wondering what your thoughts about this sort of construct of the firing line may be. Yeah, it's an interesting one in the um, sense that there's a sort of bit of a stitch up job that goes on in the official history, which is called the narrative of field operations. And it's published not long after the war, in which it is asserted that a number of NNC companies uh, end up at uh, a what they call a knuckle in the line. So you've got sort of three of Palane's companies to the left at that point, three to the right, uh, and the guns just behind it, and then the NNC. Um, just in front of the guns, uh, the guns being on a slight rise. Well, uh, that 
I mean, they weren't there. <laughs> you know, this is it's as simple as that. If you if you follow through the sources um, exactly where up to nine NNC companies were at this juncture, uh, they can all be accounted for, and they're they're not at at this mythical knuckle in the line. Um, uh, and I think probably really quite important uh, bearing on this is, is the doctrine we've talked, um, you and I have talked about the importance of, of, of tactical doctrine in understanding the history. And um, you know full well that uh, no battalion commander, no Victorian battalion commander has got his field exercise and evolutions of infantry out or any other uh, publication that you care to name. Uh, and looked at it and gone, oh yes, put the uh, put the natives in the middle of my battalion line. I mean, that, I mean that is bordering on insanity. You know, you don't do that if you're a battalion commander. You are fighting your battalion. Clearly, you want it to be in, in a compact and uh, controllable body. So you don't put a whole three hundred aliens, for want of a better word into you know your own organization it would be like the commanding officer of the gordon highlanders putting three companies of the coal stream in the middle of his battalion i mean why would he do that he, he wouldn't he would put them to one flank or the other or behind or whatever whatever job he had in mind for them but he wouldn't put them in the middle of his own battalion it doesn't happen uh, as i say and we can account for all nine companies they were not there one company, uh, Captain J.F. Lonsdale's company, number nine company of the first third NNT, was somewhere out there because it had been on picket duty in front uh, of the camp um, and was coming back in as the Zulu attack developed. And um, you'll find references in the sources to the artillery firing over the heads of the NNC as they're coming back, except that they're not particularly well or not clearly articulated. When we, we know by doing the depth research that Longsdale's company is coming back and the artillery is firing in that direction, we can visualize in a way that people who were scratching out the narrative of field operations in London um, with little data to go on um, couldn't. Um, that the reason the artillery is firing over the um, uh, NNC is because they're rushing back in and the artillery is firing over the NNC, like by about 2,000 yards, not sort of across the backs of their necks, you know, because they're just in front of the guns. That's not what, that's not where they are. The only other place where there may have been a little bit of interference with the integrity of the line early on was um, sort of slightly left of center where when the fifth troop of Durnford's command comes into camp, Vaux's troop, uh, by now, Raw and Roberts have withdrawn in front of the, of the sort of Zulu onset and have arrived at McQueenie Hill, come down McQueenie Hill, Vaux comes up and they mount a sort of a mini counterattack against McQueenie Hill. Um, before realizing hey, this is this is pretty pointless. There's just too many people here. Let's get back down into the lower ground and, and, and join up with the regulars. So there is a period where they pull back into the upper reaches of the Inyagani Donga, which is at that juncture will be just in front of um, Cave's company and uh, Mostyn's company, which has been out on the spur with Cave. Pauline having reinforced uh, the, the one company that he originally sent out there with a second. Um, so they've come back safely. If you want to, you know, we're talking about myths. One of the great myths is that some part of those companies doesn't, doesn't come in, doesn't make it. Um, uh, and that is, that is complete nonsense. You know, it's, it's quite clear in the sources and Captain Essex uh, who's a survivor, a regular army survivor, 
is involved in the extrication of those companies, it's perfectly clear that all of Cave's company and all of Moston's company do come in. Um, and the yarn goes, it's a local uh, yarn, that there were used to be cans up on the um, on the tarnish, but well, there weren't. Um, I've actually found the article in which, is it, it's either Chadwick or Bunting, uh, it is asserted that, um, who's, a, who's a local man, found the cans out there. And I've looked at that article. It's an old article from, the, I think, the 70s. It doesn't say that at all. <laughs> he's, talk, he's talking about cans right down, you know, in the, um, on the firing line area, on the sort of, you know, Rocky Ridge, one of, one of the few cans there. It's not talking about the Thailand Spur at all. So that, that's a complete nonsense. And, and um, the idea, you know, when people start, they get the wrong end of the stick and they start the ball rolling. So you end up, that has to, or oh, if there are cans up there, that has to be mean that second lieutenant Dyson's section of Cave's company doesn't make it. Well, they, they do. I mean, uh, Essex says, I rode out there to, 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 to get them. And they do, they do all come back in. So I digress, but, but um, I think that's another element of the dispersion thing that's going on and, 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 and the myth making thing. Um, so uh, I'm talking, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about Vaughan's, uh, uh, War Roberts. They eventually fall back behind uh, Kavay and Mostyn, and then Pulling ends up with his um, coherent battalion position um, along the, the broad line of the Rocky Ridge and left and right of it. Um, and interestingly, I think it's worth mentioning you, that because it has a bearing on uh, on what on the lie of the land is that we know that um, a company, the Gadget's company, possibly commanded by Porteous, if that's a red herring, um, uh, advances 30 yards um, forward of the Rocky Ridge or down the forward slope of the Rocky Ridge. Um, and, and why do they do that? Well, they do that because of the, the dead, the graze angle, the dead ground that the, 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 if you stand that far, if you stand back on, on, on the Rocky Ridge, you can't see into that cover. Go forward 30 yards and you can engage targets, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, more appropriately, um, closer in. So uh, I think that's quite important because the other, one of the other effects of the Rocky Ridge is it, is it sort of elevated around the area of the guns. Um, uh, and the people on the left of that line, so Cavey and uh, Mostyn, and young husband can't see what's going on on the right of, of uh, because the ground falls away there. So the area of, of the of the guns obscures their view of everything to the right of the line. So they can't see Durnford's position in the Donga. They can't see Pope's company. Uh, they can't see Wardle's company particularly well. Um, so that that that's. You know, I think that that whole issue, issue of visibility is quite interesting about, about this sort of this firing line position. But it is an intact position. There's a battalion position. There are 600 men there. It is a contiguous, pretty much a contiguous line. And um, then we need going back to your business of the NNC companies at the knuckle. We need to leap ahead from the narrative of field operations to 1964 when Donald Morris, American um, CIA agent, presumably retired uh, by then, uh, I'm not entirely clear on that, but he wrote The Washing of the Spears, you know, which is, which is you know, in its day was a great book, but its Isandwana chapter is, you know, more than a little bit shaky, let's say. Um, and we perhaps didn't realise it when we were kids and reading that sort of thing, uh, but now, as the research around this Andorra has gone deeper and deeper and deeper, we can see that, that you know, where um, Morris perhaps committed certain historical misdemeanors, shall we say, and one of them is is in exaggerating this business of of three companies of the NNC at the knuckle who are responsible for the British line collapsing and Zulu surging through the middle and uh, smashing everybody to pieces. But that's not the way 
it, it actually played itself through. So the short answer to your question is the narrative field of operations starts the ball rolling with that particular myth. And then it evolves into Donald Morris in 64. And because that is such a powerful book coinciding with the powerful film, the combination of, of those two things in myth making is very significant. So it's very difficult for people like me and uh, you and Ian Knight and anybody else you care to name, John LeBan and so on, to defeat any of the myths because they just keep coming back from Donald Morris. They, they sort of, it's on a, on a perpetual loop. Um, and I think we'll talk probably a, a bit about ammunition and so on. Uh, which is which is one of them and also has a lot to do with with Donald Morris but there is no knuckle there is no body of African troops in the center of the battalion uh, position. One of the things that strike uh, in, in sort of absorbing that myth and trying to process it and, and whatnot and then do my own research for the project and what was the fact of <clears throat> why would you place a body of troops that are not armed with the weapon you're intending to fight the battle with in the middle of your line. As uh, um, we know that the NNC was what, one in 10 in terms of ratio from um, armed with uh, the traditional weapons uh, to firearms. And so these units have basically no firepower, yet somehow somebody saw it to construct uh, a, a model of the battle where a huge chunk of the line is taken up with people who can't shoot, it, yeah. essentially, yeah. Uh, yeah. and to put that in the middle of your line, it just, it, to me, it just needs to make the most basic of military sense either. Yeah, yeah. it also um, runs contrary to the tactical uh, doctrine that Chelmsford had published, which called for the regular infantry to be in the center, uh, the NNC to be outside that, and then the cavalry to be on the flanks. So uh, that, you know, again, it forms no part of the most recent doctrinal publication that they had seen, a, a local production, which called for, as always, as you'd expect, for the regular infantry to be in the centre and together and joined up and doing exactly what the, uh, what the, the book said. I like the way that, uh, that you related the uh, NNC pickets and, and put it in the right context. Yet, yes, they were perhaps to the front and in the, around the center of the line, but far in advance and moving back, with yeah, running like firing that. literally well and truly over the heads, up yeah. onto the onto the to the ridge, um, mm. and then sort of coming back and moving through and perhaps coalescing in a rear area as a reserve or a, a supporting element, but yeah. not this like Napoleonic style, like with guns, you know, fifty yards behind them as you say, over the backs of their necks. <laughs> and that's a great way to, to, to relate perhaps how this misinterpretation has happened. Uh, yeah. one, one of the reasons, of course. <clears throat> the main defense of battle happens and at some point there is this withdrawal that happens from the Rocky Ridge and the firing line. Uh, it appears to have happened fairly suddenly and I was wondering what the key event that caused the British to move rearward uh, was uh, and move back towards the camp and the saddle. Um, was it caused by pressure uh, from the front, from the flanks? Was it caused by, um, I'm not going to say, you know, ammunition. We'll, we will talk about ammunition moving forward. Uh, but by all means, if this was a reason for it, um, then we could perhaps discuss that here. Um, and there is, uh, as a follow-on part to that, there's evidence uh, of a Zulu advance from their center of the position in and around the same time as this withdrawal. And did this advance of the Zulu center happen in response to the British withdrawal, or did it have a hand in causing the British withdrawal? Okay, that's a, that's a busy question. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, let's have a think about that that first bit that you put to me why why does the withdrawal take place and it is because uh as you as we've discussed you've got this huge double envelopment um unfolding 
left and right around the British flanks. Now they can't see their true left flank because the Zulu uh, right horn is already around behind this Andwana and in the Manzimiyama Valley. And though they do not yet know it, they have already been outflanked on that side because that right horn will eventually be in a position. And it, it is really only a distance of a question of the time and space equation, time over distance, before that right horn is free to attack into the rear of the camp through the saddle from behind. So it's already gone wrong on the left, but the hammer blow has not yet fallen. On the right, some, a similar thing is happening, but they, they can see this. The people uh, in the camp, which is uh, offers an elevated view over the plain on which the firing line is positioned, can see the Zulu left horn uh, making its way further and further and further and further around um, Durnford's position on the, on the British far right, aided by the fact um, that the, uh, there is a ridge almost perfect for the purpose behind which they can maneuver clear of any uh, suppressive fire from Durnford. It's called the Inkingani Ridge. Took me a while to find out what it was called, but um, it it is you know purpose built for left horns, put it that way. Uh, and, and of course, the warriors who are good uh, at field craft make good use of it. So Durnford will be first of all conscious that his his right is being unpicked pretty rapidly, but also he has got a particular problem which is ammunition. Now, we don't want to necessarily get sort of sidetracked into the whole ammunition debate at this point. Suffice it to say that the NNMC troops with Durnford have got an ammunition problem. They've only got 50 rounds to begin with, um, and they've been out of the camp quite a considerable distance, some miles, and have been withdrawing in front of the zoo left horn and the left side of the chest. And that's the Uve and the Nkobo Makosi regiments. Uh, and they've been engaging them throughout that process, occasionally halting, jumping off their horses, firing a volley, jumping back on, you know, the, the troops leapfrogging through each other um, over a significant distance of some miles eventually taking up a defensive position in the, in the, in the in Yagani Donga, where they are joined by Captain Bradstreet of the Newcastle Mounted Rifles and about 60 of the Mounted Europeans from the, the Mounted Rifles, from the Carboneers, from the Mounted Infantry. And perhaps the greatest contribution that those 60, I mean, 60 men is, is, a, is worth, you know, well worth having. Of course, Durnford's African troopers, the Mounted ones, are, are as well armed. They're all carrying the carbine. They're, they're not, uh, they've not been treated in the same way as the NNC companies with this sort of one firearm between 10. They've all got a carbine in the NNMC troops. But uh, probably one of the, the greatest contributions of, of, of Bradstreet uh, uh, arriving down there, sent down there by Gardner, Captain Gardner, uh, is that his 60 men with full uh, bandoliers, uh, so they, they bring quite a lot of ammunition. And to my mind, I think that that would have sustained the defense of the Donga for a bit longer than would otherwise have been the case. So in other words, Durnford's ammunition problem would have cropped up sooner had it not been for the arrival of, of Bradstreet and his people. But eventually they come to the point where there's quite a lot of blokes who really um, can't find any rounds. Uh, in the Edendale troop and the Basutu troop, and their officers, the lieutenants commanding both those troops, go back to the camp to look for ammunition. Uh, you know, presumably at a, at a relatively early juncture, um, or, or, or at a non-critical juncture, before the before the crisis has come, as it were. 
but they can't find the number two column ammunition wagons. Um, and um, Commissary Hamer, who is the man responsible uh, for number two columns logistics, a volunteer officer, has been out on the left with Roar and Roberts. And he should not have been, you know, he should have been nailing down uh, the logistic arrangements for number two column in the context of the number three column camp. And he hasn't done that. So nobody knows where the number two column wagons are with their ammunition. And it's, it's um, the, the subalterns from those two troops uh, struggle to, to find ammunition. They go back with sort of half empty boxes, but there comes a point where Durnford's thinking, well, actually I'm being outflanked. I haven't got as much ammunition as I'm comfortable with. I'm gonna to have to get out of here. So he gives the order to withdraw. And one would presume that his intention is to ride back up the slope towards the saddle. And at some intermediate point, uh, dismount his command again, closer to the uh, camp and, uh, and, and the sources of ammunition supply and attempt to hold the right. But <clears throat> whatever his intention might be, it's really only the carboneers that that um, that stick it, and they loiter at the back, covering the withdrawal of everybody else. But the Edendale and the and the uh, Basutus, particularly the Basutus, they sort of keep going. Really, the Basutu troop rides clean through the saddle, and the Edendale loiter in the camp a bit. But there is no joined up stand on the right. Uh, at the point at which I, I think Durnford would have wanted it to take place. So, slightly out of kilter now, so I need to move back to Pelaine's command on the left. Why is he going to withdraw? Well, he's going to withdraw because he's, again, for a long period, you know, people talk about Pelaine being in the number three column tent, the command tent. You know, because he's not in the tent he's on his horse commanding his battalion you know that's what battalion commanders do uh, but for many yeah for years and years and years and years people talked about that you know in the meanwhile back at the back at the tent so, uh, and, and no no he's out on the firing line with his company he's commanding his battalion and it, and indeed there's, per, there's there's you know evidence that that puts him there um so anyway so he's out there he's probably near the guns probably moving around a bit but the gu the guns are marking pretty much the center of his position and also they're important fire assets for him you know and he can direct uh, major smith to lay down fire on a particular quadrant of the battlefield but he in that position being mounted on a horse being elevated being on on the knoll by the guns can see to his right along the front face of the rocky ridge and he can see durnford go so he, he's, he would be conscious of this um, flanking manoeuvre on, on, on the right, on the British right, by the Zulu left horn. Uh, and it, he'd be watching it. It'll be, the situation would be getting worse and worse and worse and worse as the Uwe and, and Copa Vakosi get more and more out in that direction. They're unpicking Durnford. Durnford's going to have to go. So, and then click, Durnford does go. So Pelain now because he's so far forward, he's come out to, to fight forward uh, in the plain along this rocky ridge, which gives him fields of fire. He's now got a problem. He's got to get back to the camp. So he does, uh, he uses the, the, the best tool that he has for passing information quickly and efficiently, and that is to have his buglers sound retire. And again, that's sourced in the history the bugles do sound retire and uh, the process of the six companies uh, of regulars fighting their way back towards the camp now gets underway um, and of course they are at varying distances from the camp uh, with different problems so Pope in G Company of the 2nd Battalion enlarged by the rear details of the 2nd Battalion so Perhaps 140 men, something like that, 
There are 178 of them altogether. Uh, he's a long way from safety, from, from, from anywhere, really. He's really out on a limb. <clears throat> Whereas Young Husband on the left flank, and then Mostyn in from him, left of centre, they relatively quickly uh, able to get back to the tents. So it's a different problem depending on where along the firing line you happen to be positioned. Uh, and the guys with the worst problem are Wardle's H Company, out near the guns, De Gage to the left of the guns, and Pope, the G Company, on, on the right. They've got a big problem because it's a long way from their positions to the saddle, which is um, where there will be some chance of rallying and where they will be able to get uh, a continuous uh, supply of ammunition. So um, that sort of covers the first part of the question was that the main impetus to starting the British withdrawal was in fact the withdrawal of Durnford, leaving the right flank in the air, as it were, to this developing maneuver of Zulu forces at the left horn. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. So then I how- did, oh. I didn't answer your question about um, a surge in the center. So if I uh, very briefly, say that. The reason why I wanted to interject the uh, idea earlier of um, De Gage's company advancing 30 yards to get into a decent uh, field of fire is it very handsomely makes the point that as soon as you start to come back from that area, you start to lose your fields of fire. Once they come back, once they start to come back, as they must do in a withdrawal, they can't any longer engage as effectively as they had formerly been doing. And so you get a cessation of the, of the suppressive fire that's kept the Zulu center um, pinned down uh, up to this point. So there is a surging effect. Uh, uh, it, it is, it's not because the Zulu center drives in the British line, it's because the British line starts to withdraw. So it's a the, the two things are related, uh, but they happen that way around. The Zulu center surges because the British are withdrawing uh, in the center. And that perfectly answers the question. That right. They, they seize an opportunity, essentially, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, nobody's shooting at them anymore. Right. Uh, so, the, I mean, they're some of the bravest people on the African continent, so they do what brave men do, which is... Right, finally now we can go forward and forward, yeah. do some mischief. Right. But it won't be that straightforward. A uh, segue as far as we start talking of the withdrawal. Um, and taking the, the question um, of that withdrawal to its conclusion would be the sort of the end game of the battle. Uh, mm -hmm. The story of the fugitives and their plight as they did flee the battlefield and sort of, and this, this story attracts a lot of attention. Um, and typically there's a sort of, not a method, but a, a timeline associated with this, let's call it an evolution. Um, I guess there are some few things I'd like to ask you about sort of who, who were these fugitives? Um, can we place their movement at a specific time during the battle? And how much significant fighting took place once this flight of the fugitives had taken place down their route of, of, of withdrawal or the retreat, if you will. Yeah, the, um, it, if you can conceptualize, and I, I know you can because you've been there and you, you look at the ground and you've talked about it, but almost like a hollow space, which is where the British part of the Battle of Isandwana is taking place now. And then all sorts of other things going on around that, that space. That is to say the left horn uh, coming round, the right horn already in the Manzimiyama Valley, and now attacking up towards the saddle. And then the people in the hollow space. Now, within the hollow space, um, you've got the guys in the firing line, 
the six companies who are, are on the forward edge of that hollow space in low-lying ground, relatively low-lying ground, but climbing back up the, up the gradual slope as they come. <coughs> Excuse me. And then at the back of that hollow space, you've got the elevated ground where the camp is, where the tents are, where the wagons are, and where the NNC reserve companies are, where all the wagon workers are, and there are several hundred of those. And the, the point about those people is that they can see exactly what's going on on the, on the right flank, the Zulu left horn coming around. Uh, they see Durnford come out of the Donga, they see the sort of whole impi sort of moving forward. And, um, you know, they're, not all of them are committed to die for Queen Victoria, you know, for the sake of the empire. Um, many of them are, are, are colonial uh, family men, you know, who's have got a vested interest in, in their farms and their families, you know, they want to be at home to protect their families, as it were, if there's going to be some terrible disaster, which leads to a, a Zulu onslaught on, on Natal. <clears throat> They've got a reason not to be there anymore. Um, the NNC troops have been pressed by the magistrates, you know, their levies. They're, um, they're not there because they want to be there. They're sort of a quota of men raised by the headmen of their particular tribe because the local magistrates put, uh, put him under pressure to, to, to field these organisations um, or to man these NNC battalions. So, and also the reason they're living in the town is because they're pretty much terrified of Zulus, uh, or they have old ancient animosities uh, related to the Zulus. They're, they're tribes that have fled from the Zulus or hate the Zulus or are themselves disaffected Zulus, as in the case of the Isikosa uh, clan, um, who make up part of uh, Lonsdale's company, for example. But um, there's a lot of people who, who just uh, are, can see this scenario unfolding, can see the whole thing going wrong. And they, it is they who will be the fugitives. Importantly, and the reason I'm talking about this hollow space is that it helps us uh, to understand um, the time and space factor. When I, when I was a young man reading books about this battle, you read fighting, 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 flight of the fugitives, in that order. And it was sort of a neat and logical, seemed logical. And actually it threw me off the scent for, for a long time. But actually, you, when I wrote my uh, Sandwana book, <coughs> I, I interjected the idea, fighting, 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 flight of the fugitives, last of the fighting in other words that you've got this huge or well, not huge uh, significant rearwards movement that takes place before the greater part of the 24th is overwhelmed in in the close quarter fighting in and around the camp so this rearward movement begins before the serious killing of the red coated infantry actually gets underway um, so, you know, the last stands come in terms of time and space, they come after the flight of the fugitives. So there are people already variously fleeing or fighting or, or, or whatever they're up to, just trying to get the hell out in the Manzimiyama Valley uh, before Wardle's company and Pope's company are uh, finally nailed to the ground and have got nowhere else to go, you know. Um, so I think, I think that's absolutely key to, un, to understanding the, the timeline, the, the sequence of events, the, the idea that there is this, this rearward movement which begins pretty much, well, almost, yes, instantaneously with Durnford's withdrawal, really, that, that people up in the camp think, you know, hell fire, <laughs> I don't want to be here much longer. I mean, why would you? you you can see, you can see what's happening. You can see that you're surrounded. You're, um, and there's one way out, which is that way. 
and you can see the sheer, sheer size of this uh, Zulu army, you're going to get on your horse if you've got one. You're going to turn your valuable ox wagon uh, and, uh, and its uh, draft animals, many of which are yoked in, um, you're going to try and get away with that as well. So actually you've got quite a lot of the wagons going over the back of the saddle as well, causing, adding to the confusion. So yeah, that's, uh, that's who the fugitives are and that's where they belong in, in the narrative, as it were. I think that's a, a good way that you've summarized that uh, it's a concurrent activity, not a subsequent activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that this idea that uh, uh, the red-coated infantry not necessarily are part of this flight because they're still fighting. Yeah. It's, the, it's, yeah. the, it's the supporting troops, um, the the civilian contractors, uh, the, the the people in the camp, as it were, who are not actively engaged in the fighting, who become this group, the fugitives, as it were. Yeah. Um, there's obviously some exceptions to that, but generally, that's a, a, a better way to look at it. From as you've explained, is is the way I'm picking that up. Is that a fair set? Yeah. Indeed, um, and of course the. Um... At the back of that crowd, uh, you also get the, the, you know, I don't want to be thought of as, as um, decrying the colonials uh, whilst extolling the regulars. And the Royal Artillery are involved in this as well. But in their case, it's because that's what they do. You know, you don't lose your guns if you belong to the Royal Artillery. It's the ultimate disgrace. You know, Duke of Wellington never lost a gun uh, and everybody knew it sort of thing. Um, so when um, Curling's section of a, a two seven pounders makes its way back from the firing line um they've got no 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 choice but to keep going you know they need to save their guns so they are also part of this rearwards movement but pr probably rather behind quite a bit of it that has gone that's gone earlier so they're catching up as it were but they're part of it as well and and you know there are 70 members of um of uh, n battery in the camp uh, and only only twenty of those guys would have been serving the guns on on, on the firing line. So there's a significant body of gunners, Imperial Mounted Infantry as well, are also going out of the back of the camp. Because why wouldn't you? I mean, you you know, why would you stay? <laughs> uh, save that it was your your duty to die effectively, um, or uh, and, and really that's not what the 24th are about, that's not what I'm saying they're about. They don't have the, they don't get a vote. They, they don't have the choice. They either fight or they die. And they, they, because they can't get away. So it's not that they're supermen or better than anybody else who's gone out of the back of the camp. It's that they, they don't have that option. They're too far forward into the plane. Um, and the enemy are too close and getting closer all the, all the time. So it, you know there is there is this moment of, of collapse um except that um if there is honor to the infantry and, and i think there is it is that they hold together as companies uh as part of of their withdrawal simply because not to do that would also be suicidal you know that's the only way you can live even for another 10 minutes is to stick with your mates and and fight back to back for as long as you can was there any uh evidence or to what degree was there any fighting during the flight of the fugitives by um formed bodies the last vestiges um of red-coated infantry this kind of thing okay um i, I think you're alluding to the um notion that uh, Lieutenant Anstey managed to hold together a party of uh, 40 members uh, of the 24th, possibly from F Company, for that was his company, um, to a well-known set of cairns which are on the Fugitive Trail, a long way from the saddle, and evenly spaced at intervals. At, at, as if in a line. Um, and the contention is that this is Anstey and 40 members of the 24th. Um, the fact of the matter is that nobody's 
Nobody knows what's under any of those uh, cans. Uh, they have um, hugely variable numbers of people were um, really just scooped up under underneath the, these cans, their bones and their remains and bits of washing uniform. Um, so nobody knows what's under any of them. Uh, there was, uh, I think, um, reason to think that Anstey was some way down the trail uh, for a number of years, but I think that recently that's been uh, debunked, or in other words, that oh, not necessarily debunked, but that it doesn't quite look such a rock certain proposition as it once was. And indeed, there's a suggestion that Anstey's body was elsewhere, was actually in the camp. So um, I, I've thought about this. I, I think I actually wrote it into my book because it was the received wisdom at the time. But the more I think about it, it seems to me improbable that any formed body of troops who were on foot, as they must necessarily have been, um, could have got that far down the fugitive trail. I mean, when the right horn uh, cut the road, um, and indeed uh, Smith Dorian talked about this, you know, there were four and a half thousand Zulus in the Manzimiyama Valley behind um, the camp, behind the saddle. Uh, and I just don't see any significant bodies of uh, troops lasting for very long. Um, so I'm more and more inclined to, to, to believe that didn't happen and, and that it's a myth. Um, uh, and I, I certainly wouldn't die in a ditch for it uh, now. I sort of believe it at one time, but the, as I say, the more you think about it, about the proposition, the less credible it becomes. One body of men that did manage to stick together was the Edendale troop, uh, 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 Davis's troop, Lieutenant Davis's troop. Um, they loitered it for a while in the valley <coughs> and went down via Fugitive's Drift and were able to um, cross together pretty much, or, or some proportion of them, say half of them were able to stay together. And they laid down covering fire for fugitives that crossed the river uh, uh, at Fugitive Drift. But outside that, I don't really see any um, organized bodies at all. I mean, this was um, a flight for life. Uh, and everybody was making their way out of it as best they could. I mean, you don't come across allusions to, um, in any of the survivors' accounts, uh, to bodies of troops, really, uh, at all. So I think little resistance. Uh, not, that's not to say that individuals didn't fight for their lives very fiercely, uh, but nothing that would uh, accommodate, that, that would amount to um, organised resistance other than that which the Edendale troop Managed to do at, at the river. So we talked a little um, quite in depth about that the the aspect of the withdrawal from the Rocky Ridge and the firing line and the way that the fugitives played into that. You mentioned um, earlier in the conversation about a specific aspect of that withdrawal being the movement, the rearward movement of Durnford from the Donga in part due to a specific uh, well, <laughs> lack of something. And that would probably be best illustrated by that article that. right there. And ammunition. So we have spoken in the context of Durnford and, and becoming low and running out of ammunition, mm -hmm. uh, but the ammunition has a huge uh, uh, sort of hold, a grip, on the story of this battle in the popular conception and issues surrounding ammunition supply to be like everywhere and most predominantly as a cause in the realm of myths and misconceptions of the defeat proper at Islam Dwana. Um, my question would be what, if any, were the issues regarding ammunition supply, the greater ammunition supply uh, from the camp to the area of the firing line and if there wasn't an issue, then where does this myth or misconception of the ammunition supply breakdown sort of originate from? 
Um, it, it sort of begins with um, uh, General, though he was a lieutenant at the time, Smith Dorian. Um, and I've actually got his memoirs just down here uh, to give you a little reading. Um, but his memoirs are called uh, Memories of 48 Years Service. So there's a bit of a clue because um, you know, they were published in 1925. So it's an awfully long time after 1879. Um, and um, he was quite a senior gentleman by then. So, uh, they, you know, they may not, you know, you have to factor that in as a historian to say, well, is it, you know, sort of absolutely the best way he could have couched it, as it were. Um, but I'll just give you a little, uh, uh, a little reading. It first of all talks about, um, I'm sort of people tend to, uh, to know this first passage. Um, uh, they, the Zulus, were giving uh, vent to no loud war cries, but to a low musical murmuring noise, which gave the impression of a gigantic swarm of bees getting nearer and nearer. Here was a more serious matter for these brave warriors for the regiment opposed to them were no boy recruits, but warriors, uh, but war-worn, matured men, mostly with beards and fresh from a long campaign in the old colony where they had carried everything before them. Possessed of splendid discipline and sure of success, they lay on their position, making every round tell, so much so that when the Zulu army was some 400 yards off, it wavered. <clears throat> After the war, the Zulus, who were delightfully naive and truthful people, told us that the fire was too hot for them. And they were on the verge of retreat when suddenly the fire slackened and on they came again. The reader will ask why the fire slackened. And the answer is, alas, because with thousands of rounds in the wagons, 400 yards in rear, there was none in the firing line. All those had been used up. And then he goes on, um, I will mention a story which uh, speaks for the coolness and discipline of the regiment. He's talking about the 24th. I having no uh, particular duty um, to perform in camp, when I saw the whole Zulu army advancing had collected camp stragglers, such as artillerymen in charge of spare horses, officers, servants, sick, etc., and had taken them to the ammunition boxes where we broke them open as fast as we could and kept sending out the packets to the firing line. So he's slightly contradicting himself already by saying there's no ammunition on the firing line and that he's busily engaged with quite a large number of people sending ammunition to the firing line. But we'll move on. In those days, this is in brackets, so meant to be an interesting little footnote. <laughs> In those days, the boxes were screwed down and it was a very difficult job to get them open. And it was owing to this battle that the construction of the ammunition boxes was changed, close brackets. Well, remember he's writing in 1925. Well, the ammunition boxes would have changed about 25 times in between 1879 and 1925. And actually there isn't really, um, it, you know the, the the boxes of course they change but but what's he talking about um you know and and is it linked to isandwana well I, i've never seen anything that links it particularly to isandwana um and um and also i think we've got an ample sufficiency of evidence to say well it wasn't actually very difficult to open these boxes that's sort of not true but remember we're going back to the cause of the myth here so th this this is it um, when I had been engaged uh, at this for some time and the first 24th had fallen back to where we were with the Zulus following closely Bloomfield, the quartermaster of the second 24th said to me in regard to the boxes I was then breaking open for heaven's sakes don't take that man for it belongs to our battalion and I replied hey it all you don't want a requisition do you it was about and, and I'll end it there, but um, so he's been talking about splendid discipline and all that and experience regiment and da di da di da di da, and then he gets to that 
you don't want a requisition thing. So it's that's a story um, w without a punchline. And he offers it as an example of, of you know, splendid dis discipline. The point is this, that we know that um, Bloomfield, whose battalion is out with Lord Chelmsford, had been tasked with um, keeping in readiness his first line reserve ammunition. That's the 30 extra rounds per man that goes on top of the 70 rounds per man that they're already carrying. This first line reserve, 30, 30 rounds per man times 600 um, men. Uh, and they, we know that they have to track down a, a particular type of wagon large enough to take that much ammunition. Um, and that Coghill is involved in that exercise. Eventually, they find a wagon belonging to the mounted infantry. That, that, that will suit the purpose. So Bloomfield, you know, has no particular responsibility in camp beyond G Company, uh, which is out on the firing line on the right. But the, clearly the reason why Bloomfield will have a particular angst over Smith Dorian breaking open boxes on a, oh, don't take that ammunition, is because he's, he's taking the first line reserve ammunition. So he's on exactly the wrong wagon, presumably because it was parked prominently in order that Bloomfield could find it and send it to the 2nd Battalion if called upon to do so. His principal task as the quartermaster. So, but, but Smith Dorian never quite gets around to saying that, you know, I was farming out the 2nd Battalion's reserve ammunition. And this will link into yarns uh, spun by Donald Morris, the American CIA guy, uh, the washing of the spears fame. But so he, you know, Smith Dorian uh, does say a couple of things there, which which suggest that there's a shortage of ammunition, um, that the boxes were difficult to open. Um, but they weren't, uh, you know, they they, they were held uh, uh, closed by uh, a single um, screw set into the edge of, uh, of the ammunition box. Now, the, the box itself is a bloody solid thing made in, I think, mahogany, the Mark V ammunition box. So you you can't, um, you know, it takes quite a lot of wear and tear. You can't literally sort of dash it to pieces. But what you can do is, because the, it's got a sliding uh, slat construction in the, in the top, what you can do is <coughs> whack on one side of that and it will fracture around the screw um, holding down the other side. And that will, that will break open the, the, the rim of the box and give you access to the ammunition. It's not difficult, uh, and all the soldiers would have known how to do it, um, notwithstanding that Lieutenant Smith Dorian, who, like most lieutenants, <laughs> doesn't really know his, his heart from his elbow, <laughs> uh, doesn't. And also, of course, what we know, is that the Martini Henry cleaning kit has a as a screwdriver uh, fitting? Um, thank you very much. Uh, just it's, like that, one of those. <laughs> several, several screwdriver fittings. Several. <laughs> so, uh, just about everybody's got one of those. Um, uh, and and you have this sort of story about it being difficult to find screwdrivers. Well, you know, all the blokes have got screwdrivers um, as part of their kit. Um, and um, you, you then, so, so he, he sort of starts the, the, the ball rolling. I, 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 but of course, he's even in the act of describing how he is himself sending ammunition out to the firing line. And the other key witness here is his boss, uh, Edward Essex. He's a sub-director of transport. Edward Essex is the director of transport in the, in the 75th Regiment. Lucky Essex, as he's known. Because he will also survive the uh, the Battle of Lang's Neck uh, in 1881, just up the road in the Transvaal. Um, Lucky Essex, uh, well, I mean, you can hear the sarcasm, can't you? <laughs> uh, but there's no, uh, I infer no, um, uh, I cast no aspersions in Lucky Essex's direction. Uh, but um, you know, he he was able to get away. Uh, because he was like Smith Dorian, a fugitive, and I, you know, I think we do need to confront the fact that, you know, when they 
when it came to making their reports and writing their accounts, they were necessarily obfuscating the fact that they were fugitives and you know, did not stick around to see the, the end of the battle. If they'd stuck around to see the end of the battle, they would have been dead. And the fact that they survived um, is, is clearly suggests that they left at uh, some intermediate point. But Essex Simley is an important witness, and he also talks about his activities in um, getting ammunition out of the firing line, including, uh, in his case, loading up a mule cart. So Smith Dorian is talking about sending runners out. Um, Essex is talking about sending a mule cart out. Now, a mule cart is a big old thing can carry a lot of ammunition. When um, the archaeologist uh, Tony Pollard and uh, Ian Knight uh, did a little bit of digging out to Isanwana, or a bit of snooping around, really, rather than digging, um, they were able to look. Uh, actually, I shouldn't comment on that because I've never seen their, their report, but I know um, that they found, whether by digging or by snooping around, um, uh, the, the several uh, finds that, that related to ammunition boxes, the, the bent screws um, and banding from the boxes. Uh, so again, that confirms archaeologically that there, there was ammunition uh, boxes on, on the firing line, that they were making their way out there. Now, the other thing that um, Smith Dorian is not in a position to comment on is whether there was any ammunition on the firing line because he's not on the firing line, he's in the camp. So he doesn't know. He doesn't know that the, the, the withdrawal is connected to uh, a failure of ammunition because he, he doesn't get to speak to any of these men who are about to die. Um, he's gonna leave the camp as a fugitive. He's in the camp, he's leaving the camp. So he doesn't know why they're withdrawing. So he's not, he's not a competent witness in that sense to say that there's no ammunition on the firing line. And then um, we, let's take the, the, the proposition itself that um, these men are out of ammunition. Well, they're not. I mean, they are some, in some cases, they are the best part of a mile from the saddle, yet they will die in the saddle. They did not get from the Rocky Ridge to the saddle by um, fighting hand to hand. Can't be done. You die of physical exhaustion after 100 yards, let alone, let alone a mile. Um, and yet, but when I did all the, the maths to nail down the groups of bodies where they were and so on, uh, based on primary sources, you know, I was able to put something up around 400 of 600 members of the 24th in the saddle area. So very significant slices of Pauline's battalion, NHG company um, chums, make their way back to the saddle. They don't get there with the bayonet, they get there by shooting. So it... It's quite indisputable. You can't say that they didn't have ammunition. Of course they had ammunition or they would not have got there. So they got back to the camp by keeping um, in coherent tactical formations, applying their drills for retire firing and in rallying squares, one or the other or both at various times, depending on the ground. And they cover this mile of ground by shooting their way there, not by um, brawling their way there. Once they get there and uh, you know, the the left horn has come over the saddle and is attacking from the rear um, and they're they're trapped they've got nowhere else to go they're they're fixed wherever they happen to be at that time they're being attacked in front they're being attacked from the flanks they're being attacked from behind the game's up so they go firm and make their last stands as we would call them um, and at that point at some point clearly they run out of ammunition because and they can no longer continue um volleying as they would have done to keep their, their little space, their little world clear of uh, the enemy fighting at hand-to-hand -hand quarters. So they would have done that with volley fire and eventually, you know, there's only three cartridges a man left, two cartridges, one cartridge, uh, and then it's game over and the Zulus are going to uh, overrun them, cut them all down. And throughout that process, over the whatever quantity of ammunition 
they've actually got when they get back to the saddle, perhaps 20 rounds. Uh, you know, they're being, they're having uh, huge numbers, clouds of throwing assegais raining down on them anyway, killing people uh, in, in, in the rallying squares. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at that point, they've, they've got, they've got no options to attain more ammunition, but they get to, into that position by shooting their way there. Uh, uh, and uh, sorry, one other thing on ammunition is that really deals with, uh, I think I've said enough about Smith Dorian, but if again you come up to up, a bit more up to date, because 1964, when Washington the Spears was published a long time ago now, it's not actually up to date. Uh, it's all, all our modern scholarship has superseded that. But Washington the Spears still has this sort of mythological place in the minds of uh, of many, uh, and it, and it perpetuates uh, this ammunition myth. Morris says that Bloomfield wouldn't issue ammunition to um, first battalion companies, because he's the quartermaster of the second battalion, and vice versa, that quartermaster Pullen wouldn't issue ammunition to G company of the second battalion. Now, there is no zero diddly squat evidence uh, to that effect. It is not true. It's made up. And it's also uh, a ridiculous proposition, as anybody who's served in the military will tell you, you know, quartermasters aren't like that. They're great back scratchers. So if you lose something in your battalion, you go and see your make the quartermaster of the next battalion who's got a spare one, uh, and they horse trade amongst each other all the time. So they're, they're great sort of horse traders. They're great. They're, a, they're, a, they're like a union, their own little union of quartermasters, you know, they're... Uh, a little clothes yeah. shop all to themselves so that they they know how to get by they know uh they're, they're practical functional men they're ex-regimental sergeant majors you know these guys have been around the houses uh so they're certainly not going to be quibbling about issuing ammunition from companies of one battalion of the same it's not even, they're not even different regiments it's battalions of the same regiment so it's just not an issue about issuing ammunition whatever ammunition they gonna issue out on their stock, they'll get back by claiming it back from their mate. But that's not the point. The whole thing is going to a can of worms. So nobody's quibbling about giving ammunition uh, to, you know, from one wagon and not that wagon. Um, so that's totally made up. The other thing that Morris does is he fundamentally misunderstands uh, the Mark V ammunition box in that he asserts that uh, it, you, you get access to it by uh, removing 16 screws. Well, that's, that's a ludicrous proposition, even as, as you say it. And in fact, there are 16 screws in a Mark V box, but they're in the banding that hold the box together as a, as a, as a cube. They have no relevance, whatever, to access to the ammunition inside the box, which is held where the lid is held down by one screw, not 16. Um, and I think he says there's only, you know, there's only one screwdriver in the camp or, or whatever. Well, we, we've already addressed that. So um, Morris, uh, who had no great comprehension of the British Army, I suspect, uh, um, just went to town with this ammunition thing. And, and, and actually, there isn't anything to uh, support most of what he wrote on, on the subject. I think uh, <clears throat> in terms of sort of militarily, the, the point that you brought up that perhaps is not considered in the greater context of this issue, let's call it, is the fact of fighting their way back to the saddle. And it's one of those things that it's understood that perhaps that happened, but as you say, they didn't brawl their way back at the point of the bayonet because they physically were, nobody would be able to do that in the face of such numbers and make it that distance without being able to hold the enemy off at a distance. And that's only done, of course, as you said, by shooting and keeping them at bay yep. so that you can maneuver back and get to that point. Um, and it, that was uh, one of those kind of light bulb comments like moments when you said that it's like you're absolutely correct in that sense that in order to shoot their way back they needed to have ammunition which then 
basically proves the theory that they had ammunition because they got back to the saddle. Mm. And the fact that <clears throat> the, the ammunition ran out once the supply itself was compromised by the swinging around of the right horn into the saddle, the camp becomes compromised. And now the, the, the actual supply in the wagons and the personnel to uh, issue it and to manage it and distribute it, they're compromised. Now this whole sort of end game comes to play. And now, as you mentioned, down to that last three, two, one, and now it's my, the bayonet and the rifle butt. And yeah. then the end game really comes into play at that point. Um, those are the very uh, interesting way of looking at it and putting it in the right perspective, I think, for sure. Um, and I think you've done a um, very solid uh, assessment of the 16 screws of <laughs> Morris, for sure. <laughs> um, and uh, just to then tie it quickly back again, we bring into the context of Durnford in the Donga. Do you think that that, that particular and documented um, issue with ammunition supply within his own small command may have played a, a bit of a role in expanding the greater myth of ammunition supply? Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, because also they, they needed uh, an imperial army defeated by a native army needed an excuse. Um, and uh, for being thrashed uh, and the failure of the ammunition supply is uh, quick to spring to mind as it were and uh, but you're quite right to say that these stories about um failures in certain parts of the, of the line not really the line but but in in in, in the within uh, Durnford's command they very easily take off and and that i mean that's how rumors yarn stories that's that's they all have some sort of basic element of truth and then they get exaggerated and start to assume uh, an unwarranted uh, level of importance the, the longer time goes on as it were and I, I think that's certainly part of it yes that and our friend um, Smith Dorian I might take the opportunity here to compliment the discussion with further exploring some of the details of ammunition supply. I had a very enlightening online discussion regarding this topic with a number of people, including Ian Knight, and it started with the mention of the bag, canvas, ammunition. This article was introduced in 1877 and was to be used at battalion and company level for the distribution of the regimental reserve. It held up to 400 rounds, two-thirds the capacity of an ammunition box, and allowed that weight to be carried more easily by one man. Eager to try it out, I made one to the specification found in the list of changes. Duly loaded, I put it through a demonstration. Intended to be worn fore and aft, as it were. It fit over the head and the equipment. The 40 pounds was considerable, and I can't say that it was an overly ergonomic piece of kit. Compared to wrestling with the 60 pounds plus of the ammunition box, I suppose that it would be preferred. Having donned it, I ran it up to, quote, the company in the line, as it were, covering some 200 yards distance, where, as the theory went, its contents could be distributed to the firing line. Running with it was terribly uncomfortable. The weight of each bag bore down upon the chest and back, thumping and banging. I found that after a short while, breathing was greatly affected. That said, reaching into the pouch for packets of ammunition was straightforward, and it's easy to see why this method may have been preferred over the use of the actual ammo box, which was most assuredly a two-man evolution. Enter the subsequent online discussion. It would seem that these may not have been used in Zululand. As contained within the historical records of the 24th, there is a somewhat cloudy reference to such appliances not being available. A very interesting and obscure reference that nonetheless sheds light on a very interesting piece of detail. Regardless of its actual use and the attending doctrinal support of the same, we can safely assume that ammunition, as so succinctly put by Colonel Snook, 
was indeed flowing to the firing line until the supply itself was compromised by Zulu forces threatening directly the wagons and attending personnel. Found online on JSTOR, a repository of academic papers and articles, Ian Knight wrote an article in response to one which touted some inaccuracies. It was a very good read and was generally concurrent with the details found in this video. This brings us to the end of part two of our chat with Colonel Snook. In the third and final part, we'll discuss jamming rifles, the outcome of the battle and alternate tactical options, the reasons for the Zulu victory, the Welshness of the 24th foot, the legacy of Islandwana within the greater context of the modern regiment, the Royal Welsh, and the Colonel's current projects. For all your Snyder or Martini reloading needs, talk to Martin at X-Ring Services. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.